Hello everyone, I'm Darius Sulam from Inside Scientific, the online environment for life science webinars, virtual events, interviews, and educational content that helps you do your best work. Our Industry Insight sessions are an exploration of what is new and exciting in the life science industry. We hear directly from industry professionals about the latest and greatest developments that push the boundaries of what science can do when great minds tackle even greater problems. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Yuning Chen, R&D Manager at Sino Biological. Sino Biological has an extensive library of recombinant virus proteins known as the Provir Collection, and Yuning is going to share the importance and value of these high-quality reagents. Let's find out what an exciting new industry insight Sino Biological can give us today. Yuning, thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Darius. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And all the way from the other side of the planet, too. You're in China right now, I'm assuming, and I'm over in North America. I think internet makes everything possible nowadays. Of course, definitely. Well, if you're ready, I think I'll jump right into the first question. Of course. So what are recombinant virus proteins and how are they made? You know, viruses are uh, comprised of mainly of protein and uh, genetic material, which is either DNA or RNA. And the proteins are important for the uh, functions of the virus, uh, for it to replicate, for it to interact with the host, for it to achieve its correct assemblies. Um, but, you know, directly working with viruses in general, or is specifically working with some of those, uh, you know, highly potent viruses uh, are dangerous. So, um, so one way to get around this issue is to uh, to use a recombinant format of these protein components of a virus to you know carry out various studies. So, um, so that's the uh, that's I think the, uh, the the importance of these uh, recombinant virus proteins is that. So they can, I wouldn't say serve as a substitute, but maybe a more uh, serve as a, like a surrogate for the real virus. So we can uh, interrogate different aspects of this vi of a certain virus uh, to to give a, a better understanding of their um, of their biology and physiology and functions. Uh, so that's why we, that's one reason why we need these, you know, recombinant virus proteins. And in terms of the, like how they're made, uh, you know, based on the name, they're called recombinant virus proteins. So they're made by a technique called recombinant expression. So this is actually a technique that has been around for I think almost five decades now. So it's it's a it's a relatively uh, old tech technique, but it's improving all the time. Uh, so what happens in this uh, recombinant protein expression process is that we take the gene fragment that encodes the protein of interest, so in this case, uh, a protein from a virus, and we put this gene into a vector, normally in the format of a plasmid. Plasmid is one of those like circular DNAs uh, you can find in nature, mainly in uh, uh, some of the bacteria. And we take this plasmid containing the gene of interest, we put it into a host Host cell. So basically, we're take uh, we're using uh, another type of uh, using cells to to help us, you know, mass manufacturing these proteins. So the host cells can be prokaryotes like E. coli, which is a I think one of the main workhorse in in this industry. But we also have uh, eukaryote systems, for instance, yeast, just like the ones you know you you make uh, you put it to make bread. But yeast can also help us make recombinant proteins as well. Uh, and then we also have like insect cells or even mammalian cells. So we have all kinds of host cells and the, depending on the characteristics of the virus protein, we pick a, pick one that will give us maybe the best results and we insert the plasmid containing the protein, of, the gene of the protein of interest into uh, it, it transfected it into the host cell, and then the host cell will have a you know protein manufacturing machinery essentially massively produce some th this virus protein. And then at the end of the culturing cycle, we can uh, harvest the cells or harvest the, uh, the supernatants of this culture, and then purify the virus protein you know from either 
uh, with the cell lysate or the culture supernatant. So this way, well, we can have a you know literally in, infinite supply of uh, virus proteins uh, for us to uh, you know carry out um, all kinds of uh, all kinds of research and uh, studies. Wow, that's very very interesting stuff. So it's like essentially you're you're creating your own copycat of of the viral proteins and, and mass producing them on on, a, on such a small microscopic scale. Yeah, yeah, it's a combination of something big versus uh, and something small. I think. <laughs> Amazing. So, why do we need recombinant virus proteins, and how are they used in research involving infectious diseases? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> I think, like I mentioned earlier, to directly working with viruses can be dangerous sometimes, especially for those, uh, uh, you know, categorized as, you know, biosafety level four pathogens, for instance, like Ebola or, you know, Marburg virus and something like that. Since the proteins are the main workforce for the virus to carry out its various biological functions, the proteins are very important tools for us to, you know, understand at least a certain aspect of a virus. So the recombinant virus proteins, you know, because we can obtain them in a, you know, relatively large quantity, and uh, they're not a whole virus, so they're not infectious. So it will give, it will allow researchers a lot of freedom to investigate the biophysical property of the protein and to to see you know what the role of this specific protein plays in the in the physiology of the of the virus. For instance, the, a, a more recent case will be SARS-CoV-2. Uh, I think people hear a lot of a lot about you know spike protein, right? So this is the protein of the SARS-CoV-2 that interacts with the host cells. Um, so instead of a uh, you know uh, working with a live virus, uh, we can obtain this spike protein. Uh, and you know it's uh, because the SARS-CoV-2 have a you know, different vi- variants. Uh, we can also make the uh, spike protein uh, of, of these variants, and uh, then uh, to establish you know how they interact with the host cells. Uh, you know one receptor is the ACE2, and uh, and with you know different versions of this spike protein from different variants, um, you know scientists can assess you know if the if, uh, how these proteins are binding to the to the receptor, how strong is the binding, and what bi- uh, what happens after the binding. So uh, essentially, these recombinant virus proteins can give us essentially their tools for us to um, you know understand the different physiology and biology of the virus without actually working with the virus but you know they ha- have some they they have their limitations uh because they are only part of the virus but uh, some of the key you know physio- physiological traits of the virus can be uh, sufficiently determined uh from studying these you know recombinant virus proteins wow okay so that kind of leads into one of my next questions mm-hmm. you talked you just talked about the SARS-CoV-2 virus that's so prevalent today, Mm -hmm. especially. And of course, there is a lot of talk in the public about the development of vaccines and antiviral therapeutics. So how are recombinant virus proteins used directly in the development of vaccines and antiviral therapeutics? Okay, Uh, I think this is is also a big topic, I think. Uh, But, you know, recombinant protein virus proteins can be used directly as vaccines. Uh, So this, you know, the vaccines comes in different shapes and formats. Some of them uses uh, inactivated or deactivated virus. Uh, Some of them use uh, the mRNA, like the ones newly developed by Moderna and BioNTech. Um, So, But, you know, another major type of um, vaccines are called those protein subunit uh, vaccines. So they're directly derived from uh, recombinant virus proteins. And the, I, I think one type of the uh, seasonal influenza uh, vaccines are derived from uh, the, uh, I think, the HA protein of, a, of an infer- influenza, pro- uh, influenza virus. And in terms of SARS-CoV-2, I think there are different platforms. For instance, I think the one from Novavax is derived from, uh, is also a, um, a, re- a recombinant protein subunit vaccine. And I think there are several companies in China uh, are developing a, a second generation um, subu- uh, recombinant subunit uh, vaccines based on the SARS-CoV-2 um, 
spike protein as well. So, um, so they can. So the recombinant virus proteins are uh, indeed they can be used directly, either as vaccines, or they can be used as tools to to help you know vaccine development. So, so one thing is that when we have these uh, recombinant proteins, we can use them to create antibodies that recognizes these uh, recombinant proteins. And then, uh, for instance, if we would like to develop a mRNA vaccine, um, so we would have to ac- assess that when once the mRNA is in integrated into the whole uh, into the cells of a uh, of a human human being or, or of a uh, you know lab animal they, it can indeed display these uh, antigens on the surface of the uh, of the cells that harbor these mrnas so one tool to determine that is the antibodies derived from from these you know recombinant virus uh, proteins. So they are one major tools for us to, you know, achieve these purposes. And also, um, in terms of uh, like antivirus therapeutics, because you know viruses have different parts. So let's take SARS-CoV-2 again, for example, because it's uh, like you said, it's uh, it's it's ongoing, and I think uh, uh, people are relatively familiar uh, with this uh, with this virus. Uh, the spike protein is the main gateway for you know viral host interactions so people can develop these um, uh, therapeutic antibodies and you know ag- directly against the spike protein so therapeutic antibodies are one form of you know antivirus therapeutics and also uh, i think in the uh, in the source cov2 it has its proteases its rna polymerase so people can um, take these two recombinant proteins, solve their structure, and to see, um, you know, within those uh, the space of those proteins, if we can fit some, you know, s- small molecule inhibitors. Um, once they identify these inhibitors, then they can take them and, and make them into, you know, small molecule antiviral drugs as well. So I think the recombinant virus proteins are also very critical tools for us to, um, you know, develop these, you know, antiviral ther- therapeutics. Okay, amazing. So you talked a little bit about how these universal vaccines and broad spectrum antiviral therapeutics could be used. Do you? What do you think the future might hold for this amazing technology? I think people are paying more and more attention to these, you know, one vaccine that that can be used to prevent different variants from one disease. Um, so, so for instance, uh, I think we update our seasonal flu vaccines like on a on a yearly basis. But it would be nice to have a you know one vaccine that can help us go you know against you know different. Uh, influenza strengths, and that the same goes as for the uh, SARS-CoV-2 as well. You know, these universal vaccines are uh, re- relatively difficult to make because vi- viruses mutates all the time, and we never know what kind of a mutation they're going to uh, present us. So, for instance, for the SARS-CoV-2, from the the Wuhan strain and all the way to Delta, there were just only a small number of mutations occurring in, in the spike protein. But then comes Omicron, uh, which completely shatters, I think, people's view of you know uh, what kind of a I think a mutation capacity a virus can bring up. And so, because they're so volat- volatile, it's, it is relatively difficult to develop these you know universal vaccines or of uh, for that same matter, these so-called broad-spectrum antivirus therapeutics, uh, because if, the, for instance, for SARS-CoV-2, if an antibody is against one particular, um, <clears throat> has has a good effect on one particular strain, uh, but when the when a lot of mutations occur, uh, it might completely or wouldn't say completely, it might partially or completely uh, destroy the, um, the the epitopes where the antibody binds to the um, to the to the to the virus protein and render it, uh, it render it less effective or even uh, completely ineffective. Uh, so it's it's a challenging um, it's a challenging process, but uh, um, I think at least in terms of uh, um, the universal vaccine front, uh, we are having some encouraging uh, news. I think just last year, uh, FDA started a uh, I think a clinical trial for a form. 
of uh, universal flu vaccine. I think quite promising. Um, it's derived from, I think, an H1 H1N1 formula, and uh, they grafted, you know, the HA protein of, you know, different, uh, I think, different strains into this into this formula. And what happens is, uh, with one injection, I think people can are able to develop antibodies, you know, against the different influenza strains. So this is, I think, this is only. A, would say like the first step. I think in the future uh, there will be more and more different, either different types of universal vaccines or even different formats of universal vaccines available or under development. Because the uh, I think the mRNA platform is relatively new and has been proven to be quite effective in terms of uh, uh, vaccine development and fast in in the in the same time. So I think with this technology and uh, also, with the uh, more conventional, you know, recombinant recombinant subunit vaccine approach, uh, we might be able to have a a format of universal vaccine against either influenza or coronaviruses in general uh, in in the future. And in terms of these, like a broad spectrum antivirus therapeutics, viruses do have, you know, viruses mutate a lot, but you know, they do have some key uh, regimens in their. Uh, in their genome or in their proteome that cannot be replaced. So, for instance, the uh, RNA polymerase or their proteases, they they are relatively, I think, they're relatively stable, if that for lack of a better term, in terms of their mutation rates. So, um, I think scientists are now uh, developing uh, antiviral therapeutics against these relatively more conserved targets. So, I think in the future there will be either small molecules or antibody, you know, antivirus therapeutics uh, for a more broad spectrum applications. The appeal of having a universal vaccine for influenza and the coronavirus would be revolutionary for sure. So this technology is clearly something of great interest, especially today. Uh, Yuning, what, what resources are out there to procure recombinant virus proteins and what specialties are required for their production? I think a lot of people, uh, because this you know recombinant protein expression uh, technique has been around for uh, for a long time, so I think there are a lot of uh, like research institutes or uh, biotech companies that are working in this realm to produce uh, these recombinant proteins. So uh, I think there are a lot of companies out there uh, with a good. Uh, recombinant virus protein categor- category. So, for instance, uh, Sinobiological and some other companies, and uh, and of course, um, you, uh, I think the research institutes, universities are also the core of any field of scientific studies. So, uh, some of the, the research labs might also have some resources in terms of these uh, recombinant virus proteins. They would be happy to share. So, I think that's the two two major resources in terms of uh, where we can obtain some of these uh, recombinant virus proteins. I think it's trade for like 50 years. So people, um, so there are a lot of uh, either technical know-hows and knowledges and experience has been gathered dur- during this time. So for a company or a lab to be able to make these recombinant proteins, I think the requirement come both ways, software and hardware. So um, because these cell cultures re- will require uh, either shaker flasks or even fermenters or these gigantic bioreactors. So depending on the on the quantity of the the material you will need, it will require you know cor- corresponding culturing methods, and also um, because it's a, a, a the technique has been around for four or five decades, and there are indeed a lot of uh, you know host system to select from, and each system ha- has to be you know treated with with respect, and uh, and some you know experience are needed to in order to use each expression system well and to solve problems believe me they do occur <laughs> uh, so we have our you know fair share of making recombinant virus proteins using uh, different systems so that that I can guarantee <laughs> so there will be problems so yeah so both the hardware and the software so when they're combined correctly effectively uh, we, we should be able to uh, produce uh, all kinds of uh, recombinant virus virus proteins for, you know, essentially for everybody. Amazing. 
let's focus directly on the offerings that Sino Biological provides. And you're, you, of course, are the expert in this. So can you give us a brief introduction to the Provir recombinant virus protein collection that Sino Biological has? Yeah, thank. Uh, well, I'm glad you asked. So well, we are actually quite proud of this uh, Provir platform. Uh, our founder, he actually worked at Merck uh, and uh, for for a long time, and he was one of the leading scientists in uh, one of their vaccine development platforms. So when he uh, returned back to China and uh, established the Sino Biological, I think he also uh, would like us to focus on or pay attention attention to infectious disease from. So the company has been, uh, you know, around for maybe 15 years. I think we just had our anniversary uh, sometime this, uh, sometime in April. During, I think during this uh, prolonged 15 years or so, we would like to have, you know, at least a part of our attention devoted to uh, infectious diseases. So we created a lot of uh, recombinant virus proteins from different viruses and different disease areas and put them all together in this uh, Provir uh, recombinant virus protein collection. We have an extensive collection of the SARS-CoV-2 stuff, uh, either from parts of the spike protein and different uh, spike proteins from different variants. And we also have a uh, extensive uh, collection of uh, uh, influenza proteins. You know, scientists can take these proteins and mix mix them up and uh, try to make these, you know, universal vaccines. And uh, we also have a very extensive uh, pipeline uh, for, you know, upper respiratory disease viruses. And I think a lot of these proteins uh, have been used to formulate into a, I think, into a chip format that can be used to essentially screen for what type of uh, upper respiratory uh, disease a, a patient you know, has using a relatively uh, high throughput format. So I think we have maybe uh, over, uh, I think it should be over a thousand or maybe close to 2,000 recombinant proteins in this Provir collection. Also to go with these proteins, we and for some of them, we have developed these highly specific antibodies for diagnostic purposes, just to use these antibodies to recognize those proteins so that we can detect these proteins in, you know, various uh, assay formats. So I think at the, uh, especially I think at the end, at uh, the beginning of this SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, um, you know, because of the similarities uh, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus and the previous SARS virus, some of the antibodies uh, that are uh, derived that were derived from the SARS virus couldn't be, you know, directly uh, used for the SARS-CoV-2, uh, and uh, I think that, that gave us and uh, you know and people who use these antibodies a quick start to develop either you know diagnostic tools or to help uh, at early stage of you know vaccine development. So there maybe it's essentially a pieces of uh, you know a little bit of everything. So and it's a it's a it's a big collection. So uh, if someone is interested in you know um, doing research uh, regarding uh, vi- virology or r- using recombinant uh, you know virus proteins or antibodies, uh, I think this is this is the go to place to to procure these procure these reagents. And we do also have quite a stringent quality control uh, measurements uh, so that these uh, proteins and antibodies are of top quality. We hope the, you know, the material in this collections to help the, to, to help scientists all over the world to fight off current infectious diseases and also help to prepare uh, the ones that might come in the, in the, in the future. Thank you so much, Yuning, for all of your insights today. I, I really hope that when the day comes that I get my universal vaccine, Uh, I'll be able to thank you and your colleagues for all the work that you are doing in developing this groundbreaking technology at Sino Biological. It was a pleasure to have you with us today. It was a pleasure talking to you too. I hope that you've all enjoyed this episode of Industry Insights and that you'll tune in to future episodes where industry professionals just like you answer questions about their work and how their companies are sharing science. Don't forget to subscribe.